All right, well, welcome to our one hour lead AP BD plus E study session. Um, we're going to be using the GoToWebinar platform here. Uh, there's some controls over on the right side. Uh, we really want to make sure that all of you have what you need to pass the Lead AP BD plus E specialty credential exam. I'm going to be your instructor today. My name is Charlie Cicchetti. I'm the CEO here at Green Building Education Services. Uh, some of you have found us because you're customers. Maybe you're using our study tools right now. Maybe you've already passed the Lead Green Associate exam. Congrats. You're ready for that next level lead professional credential exam. Others, maybe you're just curious what needs to happen to pass a lead accredited professional exam focused on new commercial construction and major innovation. So um, that being said, let's go ahead and dive in here to our agenda. Here's what we've got to cover today. I'm going to try to do the best job I can to go through just a little bit of each of the core categories to give you a level of detail that you're going to need to go to when it comes to location and sites and water and energy. You know, this isn't an eight-hour class. This is a one-hour study session. <clears throat> I really want to let you know what I think you need to know to pass this exam, and we'll go through each category. <clears throat> we'll talk about some study tips. I've taken and passed this exam. I've actually taken and passed all of the lead exams. And I really want to make sure you know that the BD plus C is more technical. It is 100 questions, multiple choice. But some of those questions are going to be more difficult than what you've already experienced on the LEED Green Associate exam. That being said, <clears throat> let's dive into our slides here. Our outline is to talk about how do you prepare. Uh, some of you might learn best by reading. Some of you might learn best by taking practice tests or listening. Let's talk about the level of detail you've got to get to. We're going to cover what are some of those minimum program requirements. Just a reminder on how do you get a lead project from start to finish. Yes, the lead green associate exam that most of you have probably already taken and passed, that 100 question exam is higher level, higher altitude, lots of terms and definitions, green buildings. Where does this fit into lead? What do you have to do? What's nice to do to get extra points? Here on the BD plus C, though, let's just remind you a little bit about that lead process, the minimum requirements. Okay, we're signing up our project, and we're going to go for that official lead building design and construction certification. Uh, as I mentioned, we're going to go through each of the categories. Location and transportation is a good opportunity for me to suggest that you all know this is a lead V4. You know, every five or six years or so, LEED is going to raise the bar. For technical exam, I know some of you have already passed the green associate. You're moving on. You're taking this next level exam. Our study session today, it's not an eight-hour prep. It's, hey, we've got a little bit of time just for me to tell you, here's what I think you need to know to pass the level of difficulty on each one of these categories. There are some questions that have calculations on it. So the LEED AP BD plus C, it is a 100 question multiple choice exam. For those of you that have already taken and passed the Green Associate, it's going to be more advanced than that, but it's going to be a similar flavor in that you're taking it at your Prometric Testing Center. It's 100 questions. You want to keep a good pace. You have two hours, but it'll take a little more time because the questions are a little longer, the answers are a little more technical, and you do want to manage your time. So here today with our study session, we want to go through and uh, also do some practice questions together, some more tips on how to use your time in the testing center, and then go through some direct hints. You know, here our team at GBES, you know, we were first to market way back in 2007 with the first lead practice test ever to help professionals pass these exams. We've been doing this nine years, going on our 10-year anniversary. We love this stuff. We really love helping people pass a lead exam or even a well exam, and then advance in their career later with the continuing education. We've just got a handful of slides here, <clears throat> and then I really want it to be uh, more about looking at a lead scorecard together. I really want it to be looking at a uh, practice test together, just so you get a better comfort feel that, look, this exam is not impossible. This exam is tricky, I'm not going to lie, but what do you need to do to pass? Again, who is this exam for? Well, you've already taken and passed a LEED Green Associate exam. 
and you're ready to move on to that tier two, that lead AP BD plus C exam. If you haven't passed a lead grant associate yet, yes, you need to start there. So let me clear that up. Technically, you can take both in the same sitting. That would be back-to-back two-hour exams. I've done it. It's a lot. Kind of fries your brain there, but you can. Uh, what we suggest to most of our customers is, you know what, take and pass the green associate, earn that professional credential, take a little more time, move on, take the lead AP BD plus C. This exam, let me go ahead and tell you, you know, there's only maybe 35,000 people in the world that have a lead AP BD plus C. That might seem like a lot, but I assure you it's not. If you look at everyone that's in architecture, interior design, construction, development, subcontractors, <clears throat> anyone, the material suppliers that deals with a new construction or a major innovation, you know what, that's a small percentage. This credential is going to help you in your career. It's going to help your company be more competitive, earn that next bid, and quickly get you up to speed on LEED version 4. Out there in industry, it's part of our job as educators to let you know that, you know, LEED is going strong and LEED version 4 is upon us. We've got to move on, upgrade our projects to the more stringent LEED version 4. So the exam you're about to take, it is LEED V4, LEED version 4. <clears throat> Again, on exam day, some of you might have chosen to take these back to back, two hours each. Know that you have the option, you can split them apart. You could take the LEED Green Associate on one day, study some more, and then take the LEED AP BD plus C on another day. Some might ask, one of our frequently asked questions is, do you have to have worked on a LEED project? You know what, a few years ago, in an older version of these LEED exams, you did, in order to take a LEED AP plus, a LEED AP with specialty exam, like the BD plus C, you did have to actually have project experience, at least one. They've done away with that requirement. Instead, they've added in some um, uh, project scenario questions. So anyone, even if you've not worked on a lead exam, can take the BD plus C. You know, one thing that's really important here on the BD plus C exam is we're going to get more uh, in-depth about what does it take to earn each of the credits. The lead green associate was the high level. Where does this fit into lead? What's the green building best practice? You know, why do we put a white roof on a building? Well, to reduce the heat island effect and save energy. Yeah, absolutely fantastic on that side. Here on the BD plus C, it is literally credit by credit. How do I earn those points? How would I earn those credits? And just understand how the credits are laid out. Everything from intent, calculations on down to how do we document it. And this is important. Is there exemplary performance available? Some of you know that some of the lead credits you can go above and beyond and actually earn exemplary performance on. The credit categories, location and transportation. We put an asterisk there. Some of you have been working on lead projects for several years, mm -hmm. and you're like, hey, what is that? Well, that's a new category. Lead version 4 is added in location and transportation. It's just that. You get additional points for the developer picking an even uh, more eco-friendly site, and that's where we put all of our transportation points, getting cars off the road. Essentially, we took the old sustainable sites category and split it into two, location and transportation and sustainable sites. <clears throat> then we're going to go through water, energy, materials, the environmental quality section, and two bonus sections. One thing that's important for the BD plus C exam is not only do you need to know what does it take to earn a specific lead credit, but does it have an exemplar performance opportunity? Under BD plus C, now LEED has adapted to various building types. In BD plus C, building design and construction, it's mainly about LEED for new construction. So think new commercial construction out of the ground or a major renovation. But it also encompasses core and shell. Schools, retail, data center, warehouse, hospitality, and healthcare. Don't worry, for your studies, you don't need to know everything about all those. Most of your questions are going to come from new construction. Some of your questions will come from a little bit about core and shell and schools, but most of your questions lead for new construction. Let's talk about the minimum program requirements. Just a reminder here that you have to have. 
a permanent location. You can't have a lead boat. <clears throat> it has to be a permanent location. You can't have a park next door that you don't own and manage and you draw your lead boundary line there and you get credit for that. That's not allowed. <clears throat> And you have to have uh, a minimum square footage. On a new construction project, it's a thousand gross square feet. You need to know those three things. They may show up again on your BD plus C exam. To recap, reasonable site boundary, permanent location, and a minimum, a 1,000 square foot minimum there. Essentially, you need one person that's going to be in the building eight hours a day. That's called our FTE. That's going to show up a couple times on your BD plus C exam, FTE, full-time equivalent. You need to know within the LEED rating system, where do you need to know that calculation? Well, we're going to talk about it, bike racks and water fixture calculations. How many people are in this building about eight hours a day, and what about our visitors? All right, let's take a look at each of the categories here, <clears throat> location and transportation. We've broken out where are we developing the site. One thing you need to know for your studies <coughs> is, yeah, we want to build on um, previously developed sites. We get incentivized for that. But with lead version 4, and here's a tip for your studies, you really need to know a little bit about a high priority site. How do you define that? Well, it might be a brownfield site. It might be a, a cultural area. It might be a, you know, a lower income area that we really want to revitalize. If you build your next lead project in those high priority sites, you can get additional credit. So those are some new uh, phrases that you need to be familiar with. What is a high priority site? On the location and transportation side, yeah, you might need to know more distances and even do a calculation on the bike racks and showers. So we're going to get to that level of detail on the BD plus C exam. Uh, you know, for example, you might be uh, given a question, hey, there's 1,000 people in this new lead office building we're building, and uh, how many bike racks will we need, how many showers? That is the level of detail for the calculations. In my opinion, out of a 100-question multiple-choice exam, you know what, you may get you know, 10 up to 12 calculations. Now, some of them could be just rapid fire. What percentage do we need to hit? Who's involved? How do we document it? But 10 or 12 uh, calculations. Um, on the Prometric Testing Center computer, where you'll take your lead exam, you can click a button. It'll pull up a calculator right there on your screen. Uh, sustainable sites. This is the category where we have to have our erosion control plan, that is a prerequisite, <clears throat> and then next thing you know, um, let me pull up a, a website here while we're talking. This is going to be really good for your studies. I want everybody to be familiar with this. We'll put it over in the chat box. It's usgbc.org forward slash credits, and we're going to take a look at this together right now. This is kind of an interactive way to have a lead reference guide. Some of you might have an entire 700-page book, Lead for New Construction, version 4. Make sure you're studying version 4. That's what you're going to be tested on. Others might want to go to this website, usgbc.org forward slash credits. And to me, if I'm studying for the BD plus C exam, I'm going to go to this website. I'm going to filter it by BD plus C New Construction and version 4. And I'm actually just going to go through each of the credits I'm going to see that, okay, if we're a lead for neighborhood development location, we automatically get 16 points. Great. If we're not, then we get into our normal credits, and we can go through. We can take a look at that high priority site I mentioned under location. And uh, sorry, I think the, uh, the Internet and the GoToWebinar is just a touch slow today. It'll catch up. And you can go through, and you can be like, okay, we can earn one point if we have a high priority site. A high priority site might be A, B, C, or D. And this is just a good way to get a little more detailed with your studies. USGBC.org forward slash credits. I wouldn't worry about as much how many points each and every lead credit is worth. Not for this exam, but do understand where is it more heavily weighted. And if you want to get access to that lead scorecard, you can just click right here. We can download 
that lead scorecard and kind of see how everything is laid out. Okay. So under the sustainable sites category, <clears throat> let's talk about level of detail there. In this category, uh, one thing that stands out with lead version 4 is rainwater management. That used to be worth one point, now it's worth up to three points. As you can imagine, if some of these credits are worth more points, you might get more questions based on it. So make sure you're taking a look at where is lead a little more heavily weighted under lead version 4 and brush up on the rainwater management side. One of the calculations you might see on our practice test or, hey, by chance on the real exam, uh, it would definitely be under sustainable sites, protect and restore habitat, open space, and even our heat island reduction with our roof systems. You may be asked, and uh, for example, you might get a, a paragraph, a question that says, you know, here's all the different roof systems, this many square feet of uh, a white roof membrane, this many square feet of a green roof, this many square feet of a, uh, a set of HVAC piece of equipment. You know, are we going to earn compliance for heat island reduction? And you're going to need to know that if it's a flat roof, less than a 2 and 12 pitch, it has to be 75% of that roof be white. If it is a green roof, at least 50% of the roof be a green vegetated roof, or there is a weighted calculation if you have a little bit of both. Yes, that is an example of something you would need to know for the BD plus C exam. Let's look at that one together. So heat island reduction. I would go to usgbc.org forward slash credits for just the as quick as you can, as simple as you can, what are the requirements of each credit? And you can go in and see the less than 2 and 12 pitch, uh, what the SRI, what that solar reflectance index number needs to be, and how much of it, what percentage needs to be, um, sorry, up here, what percentage needs to be uh, vegetated or a white roof. Location and transportation, I mentioned if you're a for neighborhood development project, you get all 16 points. If you're not, then it's going to be where can we get some of these points. If it's not a prerequisite, it might be worth one point, two, up to five. If we go down this list, as you can see, a lot of points available in location and transportation. Just know that the lead rating systems are weighted based on getting cars off the road and carbon emission reduction. Under the sustainable sites category, we focused on the vegetation, the open space, rainwater, hopefully collection, and even the heat island effect. Again, this category, I think you're going to get some calculations out of. We'll, we'll show you some more of that on our practice test here in just a minute. When we look ahead to healthcare or schools or corn shell, what happens is under sustainable sites, they add in a couple other lead credits. Yes, for the BD plus C exam, it is unlike any of the other lead exams in that you have to know a little bit about more than one of the rating systems. Most of your questions are going to come from lead for new construction, but you will get a few questions about schools. For example, SS Credit 8, joint use of facilities. What does that mean? Well, that means that if we have a school, it's going for lead, and we have, say, a Boy Scouts troop. And you know what? Instead of them having to build their own building or lease their own building, you know what? Maybe we can let them use the gym at our school facility uh, on a certain day and time a week. And so if we have policies in place that that lead for schools project can share facilities, then we don't have to build more facilities, have more materials there. That's what that credit's about. So you would just need to look into that with your studies and just see those requirements for joint use of facilities. Some of you work on lead core and shell projects where we're going to build an entire new building, but we're going to shell the tenant space. Well, SS Credit 7 for core and shell is a very important one. We can get one additional point if we go ahead and write out the tenant build-out green guidelines. 
the design and construction guidelines. Hey, here's what we did on the base building to achieve lead. Here's what we want, and we need you as the tenant coming in to build out to your low VOC paint, your recycled content, and your carpet, and your building materials, these kind of filters, and so forth. <clears throat> yes, for your studies, make sure you brush up a little bit here. The water efficiency category, that's pretty similar across the board. There's three prerequisites. As you're studying for the LEED AP BD plus C exam, it's really important for you to note that there are now three things you have to do, don't get points. On your exam, just like on the green associate, when you see words like have to or must, know that is a prerequisite. You've got to do it, no points. We have to save 30% water outside of our building on our landscape and our irrigation. You need to know that percentage for your exam. On the BD plus C exam, as you're going through and you're studying your scorecard, I would just print out this document here, this scorecard on 8.5 by 11 recycled paper, and I would just take notes as I'm studying. You know what? Outdoor water use reduction, 30%. Indoor water use reduction, 20% minimum. But as we climb the scale, we get more lead points. Uh, or if needed, uh, on our website, uh, we also have a study sheet. It's a cheat sheet that has all those cliff notes already spelled out for you. On the water efficiency category, you know, everyone's going to get a slightly different BD plus C exam. There is an outside chance that some of you might need to do a light water calculation. In that case, you need to know that what is current plumbing code on our toilets, urinals, faucets, shower heads, those are the only fixtures we're concerned with under indoor water use reduction, up to six possible points. On the energy and atmosphere side, I'm just trying to give you some cliff notes in each category so you know the level of difficulty. And then uh, definitely for the last part of today's session, we're going to do practice test questions together. There are actually multiple prerequisites. Now, uh, we still have to do the fundamental commissioning that is required to have that outside party come in, make sure what the owner wanted is what the designers designed, it's what the contractors installed, it's running the right way day one. But for that one, you need to know some abbreviations like OPR, Owner's Project Requirements, BOD, Basis of Design. As you're going through your studies, make sure you know just a little bit about each one of the credits because it might show up here on your exam. As we go through this, uh, this is the category energy and atmosphere that has the most points possible, 33 points possible. Why? Lead is heavily weighted towards getting cars off the road and energy efficiency. In this category, we've added a couple of new items including demand response. You can get a couple points if your new building is demand response ready with smart meters, with a curtailment plan, or you're tapping back into your utility company. So make sure you brush up a little bit on demand response. If I were you, how would I do that? I'd go back to the usgbc.org website. <clears throat> I'd go down to the demand response credit. And I would brush up on, okay, how do I get one or two points here? And uh, this is the information, probably the level of difficulty you'd get to on the BD plus C exam. As you're studying using our practice test, using this website, the numbers, the percentages, the reference standards that pop off the page at you, those are most important. Again, Green Associates, a lot of vocabulary. Where does this fit into lead? High level. BD plus C, you've chosen to specialize in new commercial construction, earn a credential not many others have. You need to know the numbers, the thresholds, the percentages to hit to get the points. In this category, it's important that you know the difference between renewable energy production and green power and carbon offsets. We've added a couple other documents over there on the right side. Um, you can download those in just a little while on your go-to webinar. So renewable energy production now worth up to three points. <clears throat> used to be worth up to seven, six or seven, bonus point. Uh, that is for on-site, think solar, on-site, when it is truly an on-site renewable, 1%, 3%, 5%. If a certain percentage of your building 
can get its power from an on-site renewable source, you're going to get that credit. One thing that's important for your BD plus E exam is, yes, you need to know those percentages. <clears throat> EA Credit 7 here, green power and carbon offsets, you can earn a couple points now. Uh, you can uh, buy RECs, renewable energy certificates, renewable energy credits, and you can also do carbon offsets. Know the difference between those two for your exam. Are we talking on-site renewables? One, three, five percent or so, or green power offsets. Let's make our building as energy efficient as possible first, and then we don't need as much in renewable energy production. We don't need to buy as many offsets. When we get to the materials category, and I know there's some contractors on the call and some architects that specify materials, yes, this is the category that caused lead version 4 that was supposed to originally be launched in 2012 to be delayed all the way, let's call it 2016 plus or minus, um, is the materials category. Really pushing on the manufacturers to do even better, not just low VOC materials, not just recycled content and buy it from within 500 mile radius. The materials and resources category has really upped its game and put more pressure on even better, even more eco-friendly materials. So some of this for some of you is going to be new, newer terms that you have to be familiar with. Let's take a look together. Uh, under the BD plus E ready system, we have our building life cycle impact reduction. That's, hey, if there's a building there we can reuse parts of or salvage some, uh, yes, we can get up to five points there. The next few credits, though, are the brand new materials we're going to buy to build our new lead project, two, four, or six points for product de declaration, sourcing of raw materials, and material ingredients. Let's paint the picture. Let's say you have some carpet tile, and we really want to know what did that carpet manufacturer do to green up the process of making that? Well, that's actually going to show up here under the environmental product declaration documents that that carpet manufacturer needs to disclose. Hey, here's how we green up our process. Here's what's really in that carpet. And um, you know, this is also where like recycled material would show up, least toxic materials would show up. What happens is you have to have more cut sheets and product data sheets on your materials you're buying for our new lead projects. Now, it's not impossible. Is it harder to get than the last version of lead? Yes. And what has to happen here on your projects is really get out in front of the sourcing early. What do you need to know for your exam? Well, you need to know what some of these uh, items stand for. Environmental product declaration, what fits into that? Raw materials, material ingredients. Definitely brush up on this category. I do think you'll get a few calculations also in this category. And they'll definitely hover around, you know, what percentage of construction and demolition waste management did we hit the 50% or the 75% or more to get the one or two lead points. Out of all the materials we bought, remember this category we're focused on um, by cost. Out of all the materials we bought new, what percentage were eco-friendly? Can we get some of these additional lead points? Now notice most of these are optional, so they're not going to make or break your lead project, but there are several points available to try harder. Let's bring in even more eco-friendly materials. On the healthcare side, uh, just might get like one question out of 100. You might want to brush up on this slide, but essentially we really go to um, some materials that are prohibited, and you would just want to know what are some of those materials. Then let's talk about the indoor environmental quality section. This is that feel-good section within LEED. We've already talked about saving energy, saving water, picking a better site, getting cars off the road. Well, you know what? Now let's talk about that healthy indoor environment, better lighting, better air quality, more productivity. It's a little harder to measure. On a LEED Green Associate exam, it will be a lot about the, uh, the health 
side of things. Why should we do this? On the BD plus C, more detailed, like I've been telling you, it's credit by credit. How do we earn each of these lead credits? For example, enhanced indoor air quality strategies, two points available. I'm going to go over to the usgbc.org slash credits website. I'm going to go take a look at that credit. And I'm going to say, you know what? Here are some strategies to get those two points. Because on your real exam or on our practice test, you might get a question, um, you know, the entryway systems, uh, how long do those walk-off mats need to be? You need to know 10 feet in the direction of travel. You need to understand the difference between a mechanically ventilated space, a naturally ventilated space, or a mixed mode. Mechanically ventilated, think your normal HVAC systems, forced conditioned air, with fans, natural ventilation, think you can open the window. Mixed mode, actually some buildings can do a little of each. The most energy efficient building I've ever been in, and I've been doing lead consulting and uh, training for a long time, is the uh, National Renewable Energy Lab, NREL, uh, just outside of Denver, Colorado, and Golden. And that is a mixed mode building. The building automation system, actually, if the climate that day is uh, mild enough, the weather is mild enough, can actually open the windows itself. All that helps there with its overall energy efficiency, lead platinum, and net zero. All right. In the indoor environmental quality section, and I've got a few more tips I'll go over in just a little while, um, it's important that you know this is where the low VOC products also show up. You do need to know some of the green seal deals with our paint and um, <clears throat> you know green guard is furniture. Some of those specifications will show up here in this category. As far as the more detailed calculations, it is important that you know a little bit about like daylighting and views, what percentages are we trying to hit, what amount of occupied area needs to get natural daylight for us to get one, two, or three points. Yes, there are some measurements you need to know on the BD plus C exam. Let's talk a little bit about innovation and regional priority, and then I want to spend some time on practice tests and open it up for questions. The innovation category, it's important for you to know, is actually um, a bonus category. There's 110 possible points available on a lead for new construction project. You can see 110 down here. You need 40 for certified. Silver is 50. Uh, gold is 60. And then platinum, big jump, 80 or more. The innovation category, you can get up to six bonus points. You can be innovative. You can get exemplary performance. You can even get one point if you have a lead AP BD plus C on that lead for new construction project. That is a new requirement. You have to have a specialty. So all of you that are about to pass the BD plus C exam, good news is you can bring one extra point to the projects you're working on that are going for lead. Uh, an old legacy lead AP only or lead grant associate only does not get this one bonus point. On the innovation category, though, you're innovative, you're doing exemplary performance, and or you can have that lead AP on your project. One thing we didn't talk about earlier, but let's talk about it here, is if you have an integrated team, integrated project delivery, and just a fully integrated process, if we look at our lead scorecard, there's actually one point that just hovers at the very top by itself. A long time ago, I, I worked for Opus Corporation, a large real estate developer that was an early adopter of LEED. They would buy the dirt, design the building, build it, and even property manage it all under one roof. A lot of great early green building experience there at Opus. Well, they, on almost every single project, would have the integrative process in place. We would have a lot of people in the design meetings, even the property manager, even maybe the cleaning company that's going to uh, clean that lobby towel we're about to specify. You know what, maybe that's failed on the last two projects and let's speak up, let's do better this go around. So if you have an integrated team, which is more than a design build, if you get as many people as, together as early as possible, 
uh, you're going to have a better project, <coughs> you can actually get one extra point there for integrative process. Lastly is regional priority. These are four additional bonus points, so to speak, that will get us to our 110 points on a lead project. Regional priority, <coughs> if we do the lead credits that are most important to, I forgot to tell you, I'm based here in Atlanta, Georgia, to Atlanta versus, say, San Francisco, if we focus on the lead credits that are important here, we can actually get up to four additional bonus points. If in Atlanta it's really important for more water efficiency because we had a drought four or five years ago, you know what? If we do better with our water efficiency on lead projects here, we get the normal water points, but then we get an extra regional priority point for focusing on what's important here. So on your exam, just make sure you're brushing up on those thresholds. All right, let's talk a little bit about the exam structure, some tips, and we'll do some questions together. A reminder, you have two hours to take this 100 question multiple choice exam. Good news for all of you is there are now more multiple choice, pick one, than multiple answer, pick two or three. Uh, you may still get some of those, but uh, the exam is, is, is starting to streamline down to more A, B, C, D, pick one. There are calculations. You can mark questions to come back to later. This is one of my best tips on any of the lead exams is, you know what, <clears throat> don't get super frustrated by any one question and waste three or four minutes on it. No. Read the question carefully. You might even have enough time to read it twice. Read all of the answers. If you're not sure, you know what, guess at it, mark it, move on. At the end of the exam, you can go back and look at all the questions again. Whatever you do, don't do that. Or you can go back and look at the ones you marked. That's what I suggest. You've at least put down an answer. If for some reason you've run out of time, you know what? You can put your answer down. <clears throat> you've marked it. If you get back to it, only change your answer if you have a really good reason to do so. Mark questions. You can come back to them later. Each exam is actually different. Maybe you're studying with a colleague. You're going on the same day to take your BD plus C exam. Each exam is a little different. They're going to load a 100-question test for you from a larger pool. And then lastly, this is super frustrating, but some of the questions are unscored. Actually, out of 100 questions, um, <clears throat> I'm going to show you in just a second. Out of 100 questions, they're going to throw out 15 questions and grade the remaining 85. The ones they're throwing out are questions that the GBCI, the folks that write the lead exams, are testing to maybe put in a future edition of the exam. Don't think you can pick out which ones are being thrown out. Uh, that'll drive you crazy. No. Treat each question equally. Keep a good pace. Yeah, some of the questions are worth a little more, weight a little more than others, but keep a good pace. Try to treat them equally. If you get stuck, guess at it, mark it. Come back to just the ones you marked at the end of the exam. Only change your answer if you have a really good reason to do so. Let's talk about the kind of questions you're going to get on the Lead AP BD plus C exam. You're going to get recognition questions. These are rapid fire. Which tasks do not have to be completed prior to a building flush out? A, B, C, D. Okay, pick it, move on. Application. A building area is 26,400 square feet and an occupied flush out. How much cubic feet of air is needed to flush out that space? Okay, we actually might need to do a little bit of a quick calculation. You need to know how much air per square foot you do that quick calculation, 14,000 square feet, uh, cubic feet, uh, times 26.4. Pick your answer, move on. Analysis, though, these just take a while because they're wordy. It's more of like a problem solving, a scenario. You can see a two story building with this, this, and this. What would the project team do? You've got to kind of actually act as that lead professional. Hey, here's what we should. Do. So you're going to get three types of questions on the Lead AP BD plus the exam, recognition, application, and analysis. We are going to put this over on the side. There is a more updated Lead AP BD plus C candidate handbook. My colleague has put that over in the chat box. You can download that and it shows you exactly how to sign up for the real exam and even gives you a few sample questions. It talks about even how the exam is scored. So how is the exam organized? Let's go through this together. <clears throat> you can see um, 
how it all breaks down here. 22% uh, for the project team, who's involved, coordination, how do we go through this. 32% certification process, 32% the requirements on the credits, 14% advocacy, education. So that's how it breaks down. You know what, you need to study it all. You need to get comfortable with each piece, each credit, <clears throat> how to promote lead for new construction. But technically, here's how the questions uh, flow. One of our next best study tips is if you're using the GBES practice test, and see how you're scoring. You know what, if you're making a 65%, you're getting there. We want you to be over that 70, 75%, maybe a little higher, 80% mark. You're ready, go take the real exam. On our practice tests, which I'll show you in a second, if you miss a question, we have an option that can tell you right then why you missed it. If you finish a 100 question practice test, you can go back and say, you know what, I'm doing great in sites, but I'm not doing great in water. All right, you know you need to shore up your water efficiency knowledge. So that being said, let's, uh, let's click over to our practice test. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go through a handful of practice tests together. Why don't you go ahead and be chatting over any questions you have. Some of you have actually already been studying. Maybe you're taking the test next week or the following week. And uh, go ahead and chat some questions over. I'll try to get to those in just a minute. So on our website, uh, gbes.com, you uh, can gain access to our practice tests and our other courses, our study guides, our flashcards. We've got a lot of great tools. If you learn best by reading, we've got a PDF searchable study guide for the BD plus C exam. We've got flashcards. We've got study sheets, those cheat sheets, those cliff notes I told you about. But at a minimum, make sure you take practice tests. So let's go through together here, and we'll take some BD plus C practice tests. On our system, we give you 500 different questions. Remember, your real exam is 100 questions. You know, my team here at GBS, we've gone, we've taken and passed the lead AP BD plus C version 4 several times. We pull from the same resources as the GBCI does. So by coincidence, yes, we're quizzing you on the material you need to know to pass. Let's take a test together. You know what, at the end of, uh, if I miss it, tell me why I missed it, and let's just get my score at the end. I'm going to hit start test. Let's go through a few of these together. A project team is working with an owner to determine the cost of carbon offsets. Um, uh, sorry, to determine what the cost of carbon offsets will be for a project that is almost complete, ready for occupancy. For the credit, how is the percentage of offsets calculated? Okay, a little more detail. We need to know how do we get the carbon offsets calculated. Is it based on, and you would need to go through. You know what, you've got to rule a couple of these out. I told you earlier, the more energy efficient we are, the less solar panels we need. The more energy efficient we are, the less offsets we need to buy. So I think already I can rule out A and C. It's not based on scope one and scope two emissions. Uh, I think it's based on the energy uh, model. But do we include or exclude the renewable energy production? That's, that's the question. But what if I just picked uh, C? Let's see what our system does. And in this case, it's A. Uh, it's actually based on the quantity of energy that generates scope one and scope two emissions. And so uh, you've got to read the question, read all the answers, make your selection. And in this case, uh, I had already read the answer wrong. I was rushing. It's still based on the energy of the building. But in this case, it's we're offsetting the emissions. We're buying carbon offsets. I had confused this with RECs, Renewable Energy Credits where you're actually buying renewable energy to replace your normal power that you need. In this case, carbon offsets, it's new to lead before, and it's A, based on the quantity of energy that generates scope one, scope two emissions. That is an alternate path here. We can offset the carbon. Let's do some more, because I need to uh, regain my credibility here. Uh, a CXA is developing an ongoing commissioning plan as part of a 10-month review. What information must be included in an ongoing CX plan? Some of you might be new to your studies. Some of you might be further in your studies. Some of the questions are easier than others, but we want to let you know this is the level of detail you've got to get to on the real exam.
Okay, what do we need? Interviews with occupants, trends in building operations, a schedule for recommissioning, blank functional performance test, direction on how to test any retrofitted equipment, seasonal testing. You know what? <clears throat> Let's go to um, our credit library. Let's go to commissioning, enhanced commissioning. And we can take a look at the ongoing commissioning plan. If that's enough detail, maybe we stop there. If it's not, then we'll dive deeper into more detail. What goes into an ongoing commissioning plan? Do we interview the occupants? Do we uh, take a look at trends and building operations? Let's read the question again. What, which information must be included in the plan? And I think that's one of the biggest things with this question is we're talking about the plan that's drafted while you're building the LEED project. We're not already talking about do we have data, have we been running for a long time yet? And you can go through and we can pick some answers. Let's see how we did. In this case it was C, D, and E. A schedule, blank forms, and how are we going to test? It's a plan. We haven't done it yet. We don't have the data yet. C, D, and E. As you can see, our practice test, uh, you can keep a good pace, you can go through. Actually, at any time, you can hit exit the test. Actually, yeah, I want to exit. It's going to save where you left off. Here we are, February 23rd. You can actually hit resume and keep going. After you've completed 100 questions, multiple choice, you can, this red incomplete here uh, will change, and you can review. You actually get a scorecard on our system. Here's how you did on your test. Here's how you're doing with water. Here's how you're doing with energy and so forth. You can go back and look at the questions you've even missed. Let's do a few more together. Let's do, uh, and, and as you're further along with your studies, uh, you can actually take our questions by category. So what if we wanted to take just water efficiency questions in a row? Well, we can do that. Which type of fixture is eligible for water sense label? Okay. Here's one of those very quick recall questions. You know the answer, you mark it, you move on. Is it a private laboratory faucet, a composting toilet, a waterless urinal, or a tankless toilet? So water sense label, where is that most eligible? Well, I don't think it's B, I don't think it's A. I think we're getting down to either the urinal or the toilet. Let's put D. In this case, uh, actually the water sense label. Um, tanked toilets, water using urinals, private faucets, and shower heads can all get the water sense label, but the following cannot. Our system has just told us that. We're not going to miss that question again. A project team will not pursue points under water efficiency credit, indoor water use reduction. Which information should be included by the MEP engineer for the prescriptive path of water efficiency prerequisite indoor water use reduction? All right, so within LEED, <clears throat> certain projects might not want to go for all the extra points. There's an easier, quicker prescriptive path that you can do to show compliance for the prerequisite. Do we aggregate the uh, fixture calculations, product cut sheets, and fixture schedules? occupancy, all fixtures must meet the baseline. What are we actually going to provide here? In that case, it was B. We got it right. It moved us on. So that's just an example of our practice tests. I don't want those to seem intimidating, but I also want the reality check that this is a professional credential closed book exam that you do have to put in some study time for. Some of the questions are more direct, a little easier than others. Some take a little while to kind of think through, maybe do a calculation. Some of the resources to recap, I know we're at time. I'm going to stay on here for some more questions. I really want all of you to have access to usgbc.org forward slash credits. Remember, this is a very important site, so you can get into the level of difficulty credit by credit. 
I want to make sure you also understand that here at GBES.com, we have awesome practice tests. At a minimum, you need to practice test. They're fantastic. Hopefully, we helped you pass the green associate with our practice tests or courses. If you wanted to take a look at some of our other study materials, uh, for this session, uh, we're offering up a 15% discount here for you being in our webinar today. We really appreciate you and want to help you pass the lead AP BD plus C. There's your coupon code GBES 2017 BDC, 15% off. Thank you very much. Let's go to some questions here. And let's see, uh, some of you I know might need to drop off. We're going to record this, and uh, we'll make sure we send it out to everyone. If you have any questions at all, uh, I'll make sure my contact information is available. We really want you to pass this test. Put in the time, and you're going to do well and pass this exam. All right, let's take a look at some of our questions. Okay, just a second here. Uh, is there a difference between institutional buildings and healthcare? For example, a senior living facility, might this be considered institutional versus healthcare? Good question. Uh, Abigail, thank you. And so, uh, what happens on a lead? for new construction project is <clears throat> health care is typically going to be your medical office, your hospital. Um, <clears throat> you know, you can divide it by inpatient, outpatient, but uh, more on the uh, institutional side and even like a college. Say you have a nursing school at a college. You know what, if, if there's a gray area, you can run a lead scorecard for both and you can see which would be more advantageous. You can always make the argument back to lead, hey, you know what, I want to pursue this rating system and here's why. Um, if it was a college, an institution uh, that maybe even had a school within it, uh, I think it would be typically more lead for new construction. Uh, honestly, that would be simpler. It's a little less difficult to achieve. Uh, the healthcare is more for your hospital, your medical office, from my experience. Good question. Uh, okay, what are the max points for innovation? Um, uh, good question here. Let's take a look together. So under the innovation category, <clears throat> there is this tricky question you might get. Even though there's up to five innovation points and one for Elite AP, yes, you can only get two for doing exemplary performance, and you can mix and match the others for innovation. So just got to take a look at that. Um, as much as we'd like to max out all the credits, you can only get a couple exemplary performance, but you can get three or more innovation. So good question, but it's more of a cap on exemplary than it is a cap on innovation. Thank you for that question. Let's talk regional priority. Um, how do you determine where your project's located? What are your regional priorities? Well, let me show you. And again, I know we're just over time. Sorry for our technical difficulty earlier, but we really appreciate you being with us today. If you can stay on, hey, let's keep talking. So let's go to uh, regional priority credits. It's actually easier just to Google that. I don't have the shortcut handy. It's USGBC. Uh, org slash RPC, but let's take a look together. And uh, one thing that uh, I want everyone to know is you used to look up this information under lead version 3 by zip code, but now you look it up by GIS location. So let's take a look together. You'll type in your city where your project is, you'll validate that location. And what will happen is they'll say, you know what, here's six regional priority credits that are really important to projects in Atlanta, Georgia. And you can do up to four of those six to get bonus points. So here in Atlanta, under lead version four, we really want to focus more on advanced metering, renewables, daylight, rainwater, outdoor and indoor water use. That's how you look up your regional priority questions. Uh, there's a question coming in. Um, it is a closed book exam. Um, when you get to the testing center, you have to put all your study tools up in your locker. Uh, one of my next best study tips is actually don't cram the morning of or right before the exam. You're going to literally blow, 
burn all of the glucose there in your brain. You're going to be fried. You're not going to have enough left to actually make a good attempt on the real exam. Brush up on some things the morning of your exam. Go in there with a sheet or two of paper, a small binder maybe. Don't think you're going to be able to review it all. This is definitely the kind of exam you can't cram the night before or the morning of and pass. It's too tricky for that. Put in the time, get comfortable, and the morning of, uh, make sure you just are brushing up on material. It is a closed book exam. Uh, they do give you scratch paper and a dry erase, scratch paper and a pencil or a dry erase sheet and a marker so you can take notes. When you sit down to take your exam, you know what? You have 10 minutes to get used to their computer. Jot down some things you might forget. You can make a cheat sheet, a brain dump while you're sitting down, whatever you came in with in your head. ASHRAE 90.1 is energy code. ASHRAE 55 is thermal comfort. Green seal is paint. Uh, some percentages you think you might forget. You know what? It's going to boost your confidence even if you don't look at it. So it's a closed book exam there at the testing center. A few more questions. Uh, once you pass the exam, you do need 30 hours every two years. If you work on a lead project, if you volunteer, if you make courses within your company, if you uh, do those kind of things, you can get some hours. Uh, we have awesome continuing education on the gbes.com website. Uh, you can always come back and take a look at our uh, all-inclusive packages there as you need continuing education. Uh, if you're a green associate and you're worried about your CE hours, <coughs> You can actually go ahead and study and pass the BD plus C. It'll wipe out your 15 hours that were needed for the GA, Green Associate, and then boom, you're launched into a new two years under BD plus C. 30 hours, six of those hours need to be lead specific every two years. All right, a couple more. Um, so uh, again, on the continuing ed side, um, you need 30 hours every two years. You can earn those hours different ways. We have complete packages. Um, we have bundles. You don't have to pay per class. Um, if anyone uh, you know needs some great continuing ed, you can come in here and take a look at our packages. I'm excited all of you are already confident you're going to pass the test and you're thinking ahead about your continuing ed. That is fantastic. How about two more questions and we'll wrap up. Uh, go ahead and study from the usgbc.org website. The usgbc.org forward slash credits, that's yours to use, that's free access. You don't even need an account there, usgbc.org forward slash credits. Uh, and then lastly, demand response. Let me speak to that and we'll close up today's session. Demand response, uh, not a lot of people are familiar with it. Maybe if you're in a major market like New York City, big buildings, using a lot of energy, Con Edison, uh, you know, we have to have a demand response relationship between our building that uses a lot of energy and our utility company so that we don't have brownouts and blackouts. Uh, in short, just know that on a new construction lead project, you can get up to two points for having the building demand response ready. And you just have to look at the uh, credit requirements. It deals with metering, it deals with the plan, the curtailment plan, and so forth. So with that being said, I think I've covered the questions that have come in. Uh, again, I'm sorry for the technical difficulty at the start. I'm happy you've been on here today. I know we didn't go into a lot of detail, but I want to let you know, go get this professional credential. You do have to put in the study time. I've given you some tips. Um, reach back out to us if you need more. If you get stuck, if you're taking the exam, you know, on Friday and you're stuck, reach out to customercare at gbes.com. I'll put that over here in the chat box. And uh, you know what? They'll get a hold of me. I'll reach out to you. I'll email you. I'll call you. We're going to help you pass this exam. So with that being said, I'll stay on here for a few more minutes. Uh, thank you for being with us today. Again, my name is Charlie Cicchetti here at GBES. Uh, hopefully you found this helpful. Uh, go study, take, and pass this exam. Yes, lead version 4 is upon us. If your projects have not registered yet, you have to now sign up for LEAD V4. But it's not that bad. <clears throat> LEAD is going really strong, and it's growing internationally. Uh, here stateside, uh, a lot of projects still pursuing LEAD, and uh, I want you to go pass this exam. So thanks, everyone. If you have any more questions, just message me, and uh, we'll talk soon. Thanks so much.